Um, so we'll get things started, folks. Um, welcome to the first seminar uh, for the Royal Botanic Gardens Melbourne Science Seminar Series for 2022. Um, for those of you who don't know me, um, my name is Chris Jackson. I'm a bioinformatician at the Royal Botanic Gardens Melbourne, and I'm organising the seminar series um, for 2022. Uh, so feel free to get in contact with me if you have uh, any questions or if you need further contact details um, for any of our speakers this year. Um, a general housekeeping announcement, uh, if you could turn off your microphones while Alexander is presenting, um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions uh, at the end of his seminar and we can turn on microphones then. So our speaker today is Dr. Alexander schmidt -Lebun. Um, Alexander completed his PhD in Germany, um, postdocs in both Germany and Switzerland. Um, but since 2010, he's been working at the CSRIO. Uh, his main interests are the phylogenetics, taxonomy, and biogeography of Asteraceae, uh, which is the daisy family. Um, and he's also interested in user-friendly identification tools, uh, including the application of image classification through machine learning. Currently, he's leading the plant systematics and populations genetics team at the Australian National Herbarium in Canberra. And he also currently heads the phylogenomics bioinformatics working group uh, in the Genomes of Australian Plants Initiative. Uh, and he's managing CSRO's contribution to the Australian angiosperm tree of life. So a busy man. Um, so he's going to be presenting uh, today uh, on Asteraceae. Uh, and without further ado, I'll hand over to Alexander. Mm. Thanks, Chris, for the very kind introduction and uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I would also acknowledge uh, the Nanawal people from whose lands uh, I'm joining you today. So let me again, and please let me know if I suddenly can't be heard anymore or if the slides don't show, otherwise I will assume that uh, stuff is working for the moment. So. I understand, uh, I've obviously never spoken in this venue before, I understand it is a fairly diverse uh, audience, so I thought it would be best if I don't go too much into the weeds, no pun intended, on you know very specific scientific methodologies. And I also thought it would be a bit unfocused if I just you know talk about you know my research in general. So what I hope will be interesting to most people here is uh, an overview over the Nefeli and what exactly they are and why they're important in Australia is, of course, what the talk is about. So I will start with basically giving an overview of my res main research interest, which is the Asteraceae family, the Daisy family, then what the Nefeli themselves are, a few recent research results we have that help us understand better natural groups in the Nefeli and uh, move towards some more natural classification. And along the way, I'm going to show lots of images and, and demonstrate the diversity and you know, discuss key traits and occurrences of the various subgroups. Um, and then I'll end on a bit of an outlook of what we're currently working on at the moment. So starting with the Asteraceae, and there'll, there'll be a lot of people who know uh, what I'm talking about now, but just so we're all on the same page, what are the Asteraceae actually? What is the daisy family? Um, they are one of the two largest plant families on the planet, land plant angiosperm families on the planet, with an estimated somewhere between 22,000 and 30,000 species. And of those, approximately 1,100 are known to be native in Australia. And in addition to that, we've got perhaps uh, 300 introduced weeds of various importance from occasional garden escapees to, to weeds of national significance. So they're also one of the major wheat families in Australia, together with grasses. What characterizes Asteraceae, and, and that's also where the alternative name Compositae comes from, is that uh, their flowers are generally small and arranged in pseudantia that are flower heads. And the typical generic daisy flower head is depicted in the upper right corner, so many of uh, the Asteraceae, or at least that is, you know, for many of them, that is the original state, um, you have got uh, radiate disc florets in the center of the flower head and then ray florets, these, these pink rays, uh, which are highly zygomorphic, uh, generally female only uh, flowers that pretend to be the petals of normal flowers. 
and a very important character to distinguish them from uh, superficially similar looking families, uh, like for example the Dipsacaceae, is that uh, their anthers are fused into ring, although the filaments are free below them. So uh, the anthers make this little ring that usually releases the pollen towards the inside, and then during flower development, uh, the style pushes the pollen out slowly towards the top. And another very interesting characteristic of the Asteraceae is that the pappus has been transformed into what is now called a calyx, uh, that is generally a uh, hugely increased number of uh, bristles or scales that are co-dispersed with the one seeded fruit and uh, serves as a kind of a parachute or some, some kind of uh, burr-like organ. In this case, for example, we've got scale-like, um, you know, pappus elements that, that help a bit uh, in dispersal, in, in wind dispersal in this case. So the Asteraceae, again, they, they account for approximately one in 10 of, uh, one out of 10 of every flower and plant species on the planet. They are globally distributed except in Antarctica, and they've got an accordingly enormously great diversity. Um, so in this case, you see example pictures of 15 different tribes of Asteraceae. And the tribes are kind of the boxes that Asteraceae, uh, Asteraceae experts uh, or synenterologists, um, if we want to use a slightly um, <laughs> uh, interesting name, uh, that we use as a kind of boxes that we organize uh, the Asteraceae diversity into just like generally, you know, when we're working on angiosperms, we use families and when we're working on insects, we're using orders. So in this case, tribes are the reasonable boxes that we use because our subfamilies are a bit too lopsided. About 60% of all the Asteraceae species are in a single subfamily. And in total, there are more than 40. I have I'm not, not currently got the uh, exact number in, in my head, but there are more than 40 tribes of Asteraceae. And this figure from a recent uh, paper on the classification of Asteraceae gives an idea here why we use these boxes, because they are more or less, and none of them is really super dominant. Uh, there are lots of tribes that have got a reasonable number of species, you know, from a few hundred to a few thousand that allow us to organize our thoughts around their diversity. And what you see here is then, you know, each of these circles is, is proportional to the species number that this tribe that's being depicted has globally across the entire planet. And now comes a, a really neat figure that somebody else designed for me uh, in, in a recent review article that I published. And that is basically taking this exact same structure here and showing how many species the various tribes have in Australia. So we're having, we're having exactly the same tree structure here, only the Australian dominant tribes are split up into several bubbles so that we can see a bit more detail. And what you can see here, if you compare with the previous figure, is that Australia has got a very lopsided representation of the diversity of the Asteraceae on the entire planet. So Australia is absolutely dominated by a limited number of tribes that are sitting in what is here on this figure called the central grade, whereas, uh, you know, more um, early diverging lineages or, for example, the Heliante Alliance, which is, is very, very uh, important in the Americas, are vastly underrepresented in Australia. And that is going towards then why are the Nephali so important and why are they one of my main research interests? Well, because they make up uh, just under half of the diversity of the Australian native Asteraceae. So this, this red box here denotes um, the Nephali on this tree. They are uh, by far the most important tribe of Asteraceae in Australia, rivaled only by the Asteria, which contains then groups such as the daisy bushes, uh, the snow daisies and brachyscom and so on. So what are Nephali? Um, here is a bit of an overview of their diversity. And as you can see, they include uh, the everlasting paper daisies. Um, they also include um, plants that are commonly known as cutweeds. And interestingly, that kind of morphology, which for example, you can see in the image in the center has arisen independently in various places across the planet. They are cosmopolitan. Um, they account for approximately 2,100 species. There is, by the way, uh, frequently a number of around 1,300 floating around in the literature, but uh, that seems to have all been based on one 
mistake and count many years ago that has then been cited and recited over and over. If you start up count, if you start counting up the numbers that are known of all the major genera, you soon realize that it can't be that few. It's, it's over 2,000 species in this tribe, so it's one of the larger ones. The, it's, although it is cosmopolitan, uh, the centers of diversity are in the southern hemisphere. So South Africa has got an enormous diversity. Australia, uh, as can be imagined, from being the most important tribe here. And then they are important in many alpine areas, including, for example, the Andes, where they have produced enormous numbers of species. How do you recognize the Nephali? Well, one of the key traits, it's not, you know, all of these have exceptions, unfortunately, one of the key traits that I've already implied by talking about the everlasting paper days is that nearly always they're involucral bracts, you know, the, the organs that pretend to be calyx um, in the flower head is papery or, or leathery or membranous or something like that. So they're very rarely green and, and herbaceous. And then in all except some of the South African, you know, and I hesitate to use that word, but you know what I mean on the tree shape, you know, the, the, the you know group that is sister to all the rest, you know, quotation mark, basal quotation mark, except for that little group there in, uh, in, in South Africa, uh, they have all lost the ray florets, um, and you you only have got the disc florets and filament uh, uh, filiform florets in the middle, and so that is why then many everlasting paper daisies. Then secondarily, when I think well, we would rather like to have something petaloid back, they then turn their papery uh, involucral bracts into the petaloid organs. They become large. They become colorful, uh, as you can see in many of the photos on this slide. And another interesting character is that generally uh, the leaves of Nephali are entire and they're always undivided. Mm -hmm. That's, for example, an important character to distinguish them from the chamomile tribe, which is closely related. So coming on to, to current classification, uh, we have had a, a variety of morphology-based traditional classifications that recognized several subtribes in the tribe. And it soon turned out as we got molecular data in that none of these uh, groups really made sense in the way that they were originally circumscribed. And so what we then had uh, over the last few years is that people came up with really informal clade names. And you can see some of these uh, written here on the on the uh, this phylogeny, the flag clade and the hap clade, for example. Um, not obviously formal linear names, but something that we have a you know name for this box that appears in all the analyses. And so we tried then uh, about you know 2018-19, um, a couple of people started thinking, well maybe we should get uh, as many Nafali experts as we can together and do a paper together that uh, establishes what we think is the current state of knowledge and what the current classification should be until we find out more. This was led by our uh, colleagues in New Zealand, in particular Rob Snissen. And uh, I contributed to that paper, to that effort, the uh, phylogenies. And so in this case, I rated uh, GenBank and CBI and got together all the um, ribosomal and chloroplast data of the most commonly used markers. And I produced some phylogeny that uh, guided our uh, thoughts about what we should do. And what you can see if you then compare, in this case, the ribosomal tree, and if we just flip one further, the chloroplast tree, all the clade names and the colors are the same, but they come out mostly in different places relative to each other. So. Uh, in the previous figure on the ribosomal tree, the flag clade was closest to the Australasian clade, and now it has traded place with the hap clade. And uh, I'm not expecting you to memorize all that, but also between those groups and the Relhani Ine at the beginning, uh, the order has changed. And for example, in this case, the Metallasia clade is not actually a clade. So what we concluded from all the available Sanger data um, that we had until you know we started producing better data a few years ago is that for the moment all we can say is that the Relhani Ine, which I mentioned before, this group that sometimes has uh, actually still got primary ray florets, um, that being sister to all the rest, apart from that we can't really say anything. So within all the main group, you know, that is sister to the Relhani Ine, relationships are completely unclear and unresolved and contradictory to what we can currently tell. And so we propose that for the moment, we're only going to recognize two subtribes, the Relhani Ine and the Nafali Ine, which are all the rest. 
And uh, in this paper, if you're interested, uh, we um, then had a summary of all the genus names that had been proposed and whether they're currently accepted or not, and in which of the subtribes they belong, and, and a bit of other information, uh, all neatly summarized as the current state of knowledge. And before we then go into what we did next, I want to give a bit of an overview of those main groups whose names you've now um, seen and show a few nice pictures and tell you a bit about where they are and, and what they look like. So the Relhani Ine have featured um, very strongly in what I've just said, so it's no surprise that I need to mention them. And that is also where I need to thank uh, Nicola Berg, who is uh, the uh, Nafeli Authority for South Africa. Uh, in Cape Town. All the other photos in this talk are my own, but uh, I obviously didn't have any Relhani Ine photos except one I got in the Mediterranean, so I am very grateful that she made images available for this talk that I could show you this important group. The Relhani Ine approximately uh, 120-ish species, mostly in South Africa, uh, some spreading out all the way up to the Mediterranean area. They are a mixture of annuals and perennials. Uh, they have a lot of characters that are completely absent in the rest of the Nafalii. So they are rarely species that have got uh, actually dentate leaf margins. There are, as I mentioned, some groups that have primary ray florets uh, that retain that. One thing that is relatively characteristic for this subtribe is that uh, the papus is often a mixture of bristles and scales as opposed to just one of them. And you can see down here a list of, uh, you know, particularly important genera and uh, Fagnalon is the, is the only one that uh, I've seen myself because it occurs outside of um, Southern Africa. So a few other examples, in this case we've got one where, uh, you know, only the tips of the bracts are papery and the rest is quite green. And here you can see also and the, the key thing why I've put this photo in here is because these are very dentate leaves, it's very unusual in this group. Um, Another another group with ray florets here. And then finally, this is Fagnalon, which uh, I've seen two species of in the Mediterranean area. So it's not the prettiest of them, but uh, it is it is a very interesting group in that it spreads out so far. Then uh, one that uh, one might be very interested in just because it provides the name to the entire subtribe is the Nephalium clade. Um, it is as usual, whatever was closest to Linnaeus uh, has got the oldest names, I guess, but otherwise this is actually turned out to be a very small group. And I mentioned before that this kind of cutweed like appearance of, you know, these kind of grayish, brownish, very small heads um, with, you know, a, a weedy, uh, life cycle that has popped up in the Nephali over and over and over again. So uh, one of the funny things about Nephalium is that an enormous number of species in the Americas and in Australia were once part of Nephalium and today, um, you know, all of those had to be transferred into other genera because it turned out to be polyphyletic, but just, you know, basing it on this cutweed appearance. And so actually this group is now quite small, so it's just Nephalium and a tiny number of, of satellite genera. So, um, again, many of the characters have got exceptions, but uh, there's, you know, uh, the kinds of characters that we use for these groups is, you know, what kind of hairs do they have, what does, what do the ray, uh, brackets do both at the base and at the top, and in this case, you know, generally opaque, fillery apex, generally uh, undivided, uh, stereome under that. Then the largest clade, although unfortunately I don't have as many pictures to show of it, the largest clade is the hap clade. Now where does this strange name come from? And that is quite simply the uh, first letters of the three largest genera that belong to this clade. So this is Helichrysum, uh, Anaphalis and Pseudonephalium. And with Helichrysum we've got the exact same problem as with Nephalium. Uh, it was the wastebasket genus for an enormous number of everlasting paper daisies. So, for example, uh, in Australia, you know, the genus Osotumnus was for decades treated as part of Helichrysum, and uh, many others too, for example, uh, Xerochrysum and so on, but were originally all sorted in there for many decades until it turned out that the group is completely polyphyletic. Still, the Helichrysum remains in its current circumscription as, as a mostly African and Eurasian genus, uh, remains uh, perhaps the largest genus in the Nephali, 
and it actually has got some of these others sticking inside it. So my understanding is that pseudonephalium is actually uh, inside helichrysum in the current circumscription still. And uh, if we then want to see a first Australian representative, this is actually a very interesting uh, case because it's still a bit um, a question whether pseudonephalium lutei album or only Australian representative, so to say, of uh, this clade, whether that is um, native or introduced or both. And again, Rob Smithson and, and his group in New Zealand are working on the problem and have got something in preparation. Then the uh, other large clade that is not Australian is the flag clade. Um, in this case, the same principle, although it was done by different people. Uh, it's named after four largest genera. In this case, they are Philago, Leontopodium, Antenaria, and Gamokita. Um, they often have got a fairly cutweed-like appearance, uh, this entire group. So a an, an slightly more attractive example here, and that is, by the way, the main group of interest of my predecessor as an Esteraceae expert uh, here in Canberra, Randy Beyer, uh, who's, who's a professor in North America. Um, Antenaria is a very, very important Northern Hemisphere group. And this is perhaps the most iconic and best known Nephali of them all. That is the Edelweiss, the national flower of uh, Aust uh, Austria and Switzerland. And then one that has been introduced, or let's say several species of this genus have been introduced to Australia, Gamokita, is one of the many, many uh, genera that were once in uh, Nephalium before true relationships were resolved. And then finally, the, the third of the really large clades is the Australasian clade. And um, it's interesting then to consider the difference in naming. So all the other clades are named after dominant genera or uh, a combination of them in the case of these abbreviations. But the Australasian clade is the only one that's not named after that. And that has two reasons. Well, first of all, it has got an enormous number of genera in it. Uh, so currently I count 88. And none of them is so dominant that you would just go, oh no, this is the Rodanti clade or something like that, because that would still be just a small fraction of the species. And I would actually say the problem here is that, uh, I may say a bit more about when I show the individual genera, that um, this clade is completely oversplit at the genus level. So we've got an enormous number of apomorphic segregates in here. Um, and conversely, however, this group is endemic to Australasia, so that is why it has got this name. So that is, it's otherwise very, very hard to define. It's got enormous morphological diversity and ecological diversity, as we will see. So here comes the next bit of scientific results before I then show the various subgroups here. As I mentioned, uh, the genus level classification needs work. Um, until a few years ago, we had very limited sampling here. So that what was available in terms of um, phylogenies was all Sanger based and, and very shallowly sampled. So what we did uh, over the last few years is, uh, and that was before, um, you know, the, the current work that I'll go into currently at uh, very quickly at the end, we'll see what kind of data we're using right now. But uh, when I started on this, the kit that seemed the most promising at the moment for sequence capture data, you know, to get hundreds of genes for analysis instead of the old Sanger data we've been working with so far, was a kit that had specifically been developed for the Asteraceae family, the Composite 1061 bait set, which uh, was named that because that's the number of genes it's targeted. And so I generated data for that across, uh, you know, a really broad but shallow sample of Australasian nefe, well, mostly Australian nefe, of course, uh, trying to aim for at least one sample per genus. Um, and then I also skimmed for chloroplast data for comparison because of the aforementioned incompatibilities that we have seen. And I used, uh, you know, a high piper in both cases for the assembly. In the case of the chloroplast mark, I just took a um, selection of 53 protein coding chloroplast genes that I knew we would find in the Faley chloroplasts for uh, the nuclear data, which, you know, in the case of the composite ticket, they speak of the concept orthologs said. Uh, I used what the developers of that kit had used as target sequences. So I assembled with High Piper, and in both cases, I concatenated and then uh, ran likelihood analysis in IQ tree. I also did other analysis, but these are the trees I'm going to show now. So 
The concatenated phylogeny of the nuclear data shows us four main groups that I want to talk about in a bit more detail, and then Crispedia in the wider sense, which is floating around a bit unhappily between the two analyses, as we'll see. Uh, the four main clades are from, you know, uh, top to bottom, the Angiantis clade, the White Seer clade, the Cassinia clade, and the Euchitan clade. Well, we're going to see in a moment what they look like, but uh, just for comparison now, do we get the same groups in the chloroplast phylogeny? Mostly yes. Uh, the Angiantis clade, the Euchitan clade, and the White Seer clade are again there, and they are pretty much in the same order. The only two things that have diff that change between the nuclear and the chloroplast data is that Crispedia is now sitting inside the Angiantos clade, which is honestly where I would have expected it morphologically. But the problem is that the Cassinia group, which has always been, you know, clearly recognized as a natural group and comes out in ribosomal and, as I mentioned, you know, this, this low copy nuclear data, is strangely split into two clades for the chloroplast. And we don't actually know what's been going on a few million years ago, of course, but everybody who works, for example, on eucalypts will also be able to tell you that chloroplasts jump more frequently between lineages than, uh, you know, you get nuclear introgression. So given that this is the only data set where you would get this strange pattern here, my hunch at the moment is that there has been some kind of reticulate evolution uh, down the line where the chloroplast was captured uh, from a different lineage and part of what is now the Cassinia group. So then what, what do we have here? What are the main groups of Australian aphali that you will run into, uh, that you have run into, how are they related, and maybe some that you haven't seen before? The Euchitan clade, as it appears on my trees, is a group of cutweed-like plants and alpine cushion plants. And they include genera such as Argyrotegium and Euchitan, which have, uh, again, traditionally been placed in Aphalium for many decades because they just look like, well, cutweeds, as you can see here on the right. Um, they may also, this clade might also include some genera that I haven't got sequence data for yet and maybe quite a bit of the Australian Aphali diversity. But this is where then, of course, we can't tell yet. It might also be that once we sample uh, generously New Zealand, we find out that it's not actually uh, all a clade, but that some of those make it, you know, this, this whole cutweed-like group and, and alpine group make it a grade that all the others came out of, but we don't know that yet. Um, what's interesting is that there are some clear, again, with some exceptions, always there are some clear patterns here. For example, there's a, a quite a tendency for the florets, if you really look at them closely, to be purple in this group. And the whole group tends to have really small fruits, um, generally with uh, a, a good pappus for flying. And so of all the groups that uh, we've got here, this is also the one that gets around the most. So we've got actually species that are shared between Australia and New Zealand, and there are some species that go into Pacific, whereas all the other clades are much more uh, endemic, are much, much more uh, hesitant to move around between land masses. So some of the other examples then, uh, another Euchitan here on the left, that's actually in a swampy area in one of the nature reserves near where I live. And then on the right, we're going into the alpine areas uh, with an Argyrotegium, a perennial species from up in Kosciuszko. And uh, as for uh, alpine cushion plants, this for example is another Argyrotegium that you will find, you know, when, you, when you're walking up towards Mount Kosciuszko on, on the uh, Kosciuszko walk. And I only just learned two days ago, by the way, that rather charmingly, this species here, Valtionubigena, has got the common name Australian Edelweiss. And I can kind of see it, although it's not quite as felt here. It's got a bit of a different, uh, a bit of a similar morphology here. Then uh, the first group that is really quite species rich is the Cassinia clade. And again, this has been recognized as a natural group for a very long time. Uh, the Cassinia group of Underberg and his morphological analysis in 1991, for example. Um, this group is characterized by being pretty much essentially shrubby. So there are some sp species that are kind of a bit weak and scraggly or, or very small and compact, but essentially this is a, is a shrubby group has a strong tendency to make lots of small capitula in rich, usually corymbos or more rarely pyramidal panicles. And it's absolutely dominated by the two genera Cassinia and Osotamnus, which are approximately uh, the same size. But we have known for quite some time that actually 
pretty much everything here is nested in those autumnals. So it might make most sense in long sense to just basically have one massive genus Cassinia whose name has been protected uh, against all the others because it honors uh, a very, very, very famous Esteraceae researcher called Cassini. So you will be fairly familiar with those uh, rather, you know, normal looking uh, species, Cassinia longifolia here around where I live, uh, uh, typical Osotamnus uh, in Tasmania on the right. But uh, then there are also, oh, okay, sorry, this is also fairly generic Osotamnus, but that's, that's a really nice one here because it's very unusual for having these uh, red and white bracts. And actually just the, just to mo this morning on Twitter, somebody had a photo from Fieldwork on Mount Hotham where, you know, you could recognize that they were standing on one of those because of these reddish bracts <laughs> when they were asking if anybody knew what that species was. So that was, was, was a quite easy one in that case. Um, and then we've got uh, interesting leaf morphologies in this group, starting with scale leaves, as in this Osostamnus cuprasoides, uh, which a colleague from Melbourne uh, split up, you know, Neville Walsh split up into two species just uh, I don't know, 10 years ago, 10, 15 years ago. And uh, then the really strange one here on the left, uh, this is one of the photos that's not my own, Osotamnus scutellifolius uh, from Tasmania. This is a really interesting little group of four species that are all endemic to Tasmania, all have really strange leaves, and also really strangely have um, different juvenile and adult leaves, which is rather unusual in the uh, Asteraceae. In this case, and, and they're all in some sense named after their leaves. This one is the direct morphological description to others are named after lycophytes because they have got rather lycopod like leaves. Uh, unfortunately, one of the species has not been collected since the 19th century and two of the other three are also fairly rare, but it's a very, very curious group. And then coming towards the more pyramidal inflorescences on the right is a Cassinia quinquefaria, again from the area where I live. And then in the extreme, we've got something like this species on the left, which is a very, very unusual looking daisy, um, Calomeria amarantoides. This species is actually doing extremely well at the moment because it is a fire uh, biennial. So we had the enormous bushfires two years ago. Um, then for one year, it will be a small sterile plant and second year flowers and fruits and dies. So at the moment, if you are in the right areas where it has burned a lot, like towards the Blue Mountains or so, um, there, are in, there are enormous masses that people now post on social media and kind of go on, wow, this is, <laughs> what is this? I haven't seen this before. Um, and then a bit of an unusual representative of this group again is Ixodia, which is, you know, uh, has a hotspot in just a few species, has a hotspot, you know, in, in uh, South Australia and Victoria, uh, which has got relatively large flower heads for this group. And Ixodia is also fairly interesting that it's quite viscous and, and uh, sticky. I should mention in this context, by the way, that if you find the Cassinia group interesting, that a few years ago I published a, a Lucid key to that, um, which is not only available on the Lucid server, but also as an app in case you ever have uh, Cassinia identification needs. Then the largest two clades, Whitesia and Angiantus clade. So here the Whitesia clade, uh, this is effectively a um, mostly perennial herbaceous clade. It always has simple capitula and these come, you know, with everlasting paper uh, bra daisy bracts, you know, with, with papery spreading colorful bracts, or they are button daisies where the bracts are relatively uninteresting, greenish or brownish, but they're always simple. The hotspots are in temperate Eastern Australia, uh, but the clade has got some exceptions and, and this one is actually one of them. This is actually an annual uh, Western Australian arid zone genus that the entire clade is named after, but mostly temperate in Southeastern Australia. Other examples here, Leucochrysum alpinum up in the alpine areas of Australia, very, very attractive species. Um, Xerochrysum comes in yellow and white and of course has been bred into an enormous number of um, colorful ornamental cultivars all across the world. This Xerochrysum papillosum from eastern Tasmania on the coast. And what is another fa very popular ornamental in Australia and has got the rather telling name common everlasting, Chrysocephalum apiculatum, is an extremely uh, 
uh, diverse species with lots and lots of subspecies being recognized in the last treatment. Um, then another, uh, you know, more, more button-like species, but another very common one, Leptrunchus squamatus, comes in lowland and alpine forms. It's sometimes uh, creamy white in Tasmania, also very, very diverse. And then finally, this is a really curious genus, I find. Podolepis has seen lots of research, including from colleagues in Melbourne. Uh, Podolepis is a paper daisy, quite quite obviously, and in the Nafali Ine, you know, you look at the bracts, you see immediately how papery they are. But this is one of the very, very rare cases where the Nafali have uh, explored reinventing ray florets. So if you look closely across, you know, Podolepis with ray florets, you see that they're not quite as sorted, not quite as, as clearly well thought through as the ones that have primarily, you know, got, uh, yeah, that got originally got primary ray florets and have got a very fixed logic there with let's let's have three teeth and let's have two that really reduced at the top and, and them all be female. In this case, if you look at a protolepis, you will often find that the number of tips at the ray uh, varies and it's, it's all quite still exploratory and undefined. But they're getting there again. And the last and largest group is the Angiantos clade, and this again is the one that's really terribly oversplit with lots and lots of tiny genera, uh, so there's none that's really dominant. This clade is, in contrast to the Andes, uh, others, uh, predominantly uh, arid zone and Western Australian, and is, is dominated by ephemeral and annual species. So this is not really a group that had been recognized before the latest molecular data came in. There is the core of it is what Anderberg called his Angiantos group, but it contains also an enormous number of genera that he uh, saw elsewhere. So um, there are two types of head morphologies here. You've got less like in, in many of the white seer clade, you've got simple uh, capitula with radiating bracts, such in this very uh, popular ornamental rodanti here. Um, and then smaller versions of that, this photo actually has got two different uh, members of the nephali of this clade in it. Halosperma semisterile are the larger yellow heads and, and large as relative, this is still smaller than a fingertip. And then the tiny white ones around them, that is the same genus as the previous ornamental, but it, not for nothing, it's called Rodanti pygmea, but you see in both cases, papery radiating bracts. And then the other morphology that you see quite a lot in this clade, and this is also why I thought Crispedia should go into it morphologically, is um, glomerules, compound heads, where individual heads have become really small and reduced, and then they're arranged into a larger uh, composite head of heads. And you can see that quite well on the left still, uh, where the individual heads are on this Calocephalus francisii. And then on the right, on if, in Nephosis tenuissima, you basically just got a bit of a spike there and you can't tell so well anymore unless you pull everything apart. Um, another example here, Cuthonocephalus pseudivax, known as ground heads, which is basically the, the name of the genus, uh, translated into English. And then pseudivax means it looks a bit like the European genus Evex, which in fact does something similar, but is in a different clade of Nephali. And this is where then we're starting to get into the really weird stuff, which, you know, a lot of uh, non-botanists wouldn't recognize as daisies anymore. Here we've got Siloxerus from Western Australia. Um, Fitzvillia axilliflora. This is one where actually I was doubtful whether I had collected a daisy until I looked at it more closely. Uh, by the way, this was only the 10th collection ever made of this species, presumably partly because it is so weird and, and people overlook it. Uh, one of my favorites here, Actinoboli condensatum, another annual from Western Australia with tiny, tiny little papery heads. And then ending on perhaps the, the smallest and in, in some way the strangest exemplars. So you can see compared to my fingers how tiny some of these are. On the left, again, this is a compound flower head. Each flower head has got, I think, only two flowers and then they're all arranged into a massive spike. And then on the right, you see uh, what I think might be the smallest asteraceae on the continent. I think there might be an, an asteria that might rival it, but as far as I have seen personally, this might be the smallest. Each of those white little blobs is a, is a tiny paper daisy head that never opens because it's uh, asexual. <laughs>
So that leaves then again Crespedia, which you might be familiar with, certainly uh, living in Victoria. Um, Crespedia is a genus of, you know, uh, more than 20 species. It's really unclear how many there are, especially in New Zealand, because uh, there's a bit of a diversity over there that still awaits taxonomic recognition. And then the uh, relatively recently segregated sister genus Pycnosaurus. So they are herbs, uh, generally perennial herbs, but with compound capitula and hairy fruits that are very, very reminiscent of the Angiantus group. So I hope that we can finally get better data in the next few years to finally settle whether that belongs together with the other members of the Angiantus group, as this morphology would suggest. So here on the right, we've got a white flowered Crispedia in Kosciuszko. And then the very widespread uh, Crespiorantia with this orangish uh, color. And indeed, these alpine areas in Australia are clearly the um, center of diversity for this genus. And then here's an example of the sister genus, which is more of a lowlandish, uh, drier area genus, but otherwise very close to Crispedia. So I'm coming, I'm coming to an end here. I just wanted to um, make the point about the biogeography uh, a bit more formally with, you know, a bit of a map and, and a uh, tree. As I mentioned, the Angiantus clade is very much um, arid zone in southwestern Australian. And if you look at the analysis that we've done here, you know, ancestral uh, range inference, what we see at the moment with the data I've got here, it looks a bit as if it may have actually originated in the arid zone and then made a really massive radiation once it moved into the southwest and reverted from there to the arid zone. And so we, we obviously need to sample a bit more. But there's quite a few groups, quite a few genera. There's quite a few genera in the Angiensis clay. We've got a pattern of several species just sitting somewhere around Shark Bay maybe, and then one or two species being really widespread across the arid zone. And so that suggests to me that a lot of the diversification of this group has taken place in southwest and western Australia. And all the other groups, uh, as you can see here, seem to be ancestrally uh, temperate southeastern Australian. And finally, I want to very quickly, uh, and, and that's the last slide effectively, I want to very quickly point out what we're doing at the moment. So uh, many of you may be aware of the Genomics for Australian Plants Consortium. I, I know that there are quite a lot of people in the audience who are part of it, um, where we are producing capture data, but using a different kit than the one that I mentioned in my presentation earlier. So in this case, a general angiosperm kit that uh, captures 353 um, uh, genes for analysis. And uh, on the other side of the planet, uh, the large PAFTOL consortium, Plant and Fungal Tree of Life, is uh, also generating enormous amount of data for that. And so I am part of, uh, again, a group of Nefeli people uh, who, have, who are putting together the data for the Nefeli from these two initiatives and preparing uh, a paper on that. And uh, this is actually, I'm, I'm responsible again for the phylogenetic analysis. This is uh, the current, you know, first set of trees are sent around, or rather this is one of the first set of trees. In this case, it's, it's an Astro Pro analysis. And so it doesn't really matter all the species details here, but effectively this is one tree that I've cut apart to fit it onto this, this slide. And I just, you know, this is all still ongoing where we're continuing our analysis. But what I find so far is that if you think back to the first trees I showed, the Sanger trees, these analyses seem to confirm the relationships that we've seen in ribosomal data and contradict again the ones that we've seen in chloroplast data. So that kind of again tells me that chloroplast is always the outlier. So we see, for example, that the, that the flag clade is sister to the Australasian clade, which is really interesting then for, you know, biogeographic and, and character evolution um, as we're trying to understand the diversity of this very interesting group of daisies.